All righty. Well, let me begin with chapter four. Here we're going to start actually talking about the atoms. Okay, so we got we got it kind of an introduction in chapter one. We got into uh, a little some mathematics and using the technique to get conversion units. And uh, we're going to start now with talking about the atoms and how our current model, how atoms are put together based on the current model that we have. Okay, now tomorrow this whole model may change, but as it stands right now. This is uh, the best explanation that we have to explain how atoms behave. Now, once we get into the atoms, we're gonna start putting them together to make compounds. We talk about the definition of a compound. And once we, we start getting to making compounds, we start to naming these compounds, and then we put them together with other compounds and start creating reactions and start looking at the products and so forth and then doing calculations based on the reactant. So um, it's just like kind of learning a language. The periodic table is our alphabet, and we put those together to make our letters, and then we put make those compounds, and then those compounds put together, make our sentences, and so forth. We got whole paragraphs, you know. So let us begin. All right, so back in the 1800s, <laughs> The the Dalton, a scientist by the name of Dalton, uh, came proposed what what is called the atomic theory, and in which he says that the element is made up of tiny indestructible particles called atoms. But it's not quite true, okay? Because we find out later on that these atoms are made up of even smaller particles. And we even go further, we've learned that those particles are even made up of even smaller particles, but we're not gonna go that far. We're, we're gonna talk about the three main particles. Now, <clears throat> along the lines, it says that all atoms of an element are identical and have the same properties. Well, we come to realize that's not also true. Perfect example is a diamond. A diamond is made up of nothing but carbon. And so is what we call a graphite, which is a dried lubricant, which is also made up of nothing but carbon. But the way they're placed together with respect to each other, the atoms that is of carbon, if they're put in one configuration, you make the hardest thing there is on earth and you put them in a different configuration, you make something that's a dried lubricant and very slippery. And But they're all made of carbon. So they don't all have the same properties, okay? We don't also, along Dalton's uh, theory, was that when we put different elements together, we form what we call compounds. In this example here, we got two different diatomic elements. They uh, exchange partners, and we make a red and a gold colored compound, whatever that may be, okay? But a compound, again, is, we define it as a chunk of matter made up of more than two different atoms. Also along the lines of, of uh, Dalton's theory was that when these atoms came together, they came together in whole numbers, in whole ratios. It wasn't like you got half an atom or three quarters of an atom. And they come together in whole ratios. Therefore, if we look at the molecule H2O, otherwise known as water, there are two whole hydrogen uh, atoms combined with one whole oxygen atom. Not halves, not three quarters, but whole, whole numbers. And these are the subscripts that you'll be seeing when we start writing formulas. These subscripts are whole numbers and there's a very specific ratio of these atoms coming, coming together to form whatever compound. It takes exactly two atoms and one oxygen to make water. If we take two hydrogens and two oxygens, we make a whole different compound. That one, for example, is hydrogen peroxide, but more on that later, okay? And so, uh, uh, excuse me, an example again, is where they come together either a one-to-one -one ratio or one-to-two ratio. And a good example would be carbon monoxide. 
carbon monoxide is denoted by the letters capital C and capital O, okay? Monoxide meaning that there's one oxygen, kind of introducing you to the naming of these compounds. If we look at CO2 subscript 2, we call that carbon dioxide with the prefix di meaning two oxide or two oxygen ions. Now they come together in two different ratios, forming totally two different compounds. Carbon monoxide, very poisonous gas. Carbon dioxide, with respect to chemical properties, is not considered a poisonous gas, okay? Now, back in the 1890s, now, which is fascinating about this time period coming up, we start off with 1897 and we kick into the 1900s, there was like a plethora of information that came in from all the scientists. There was whole new things coming in, trying to explain what atoms are, were, were made up of and so forth. It, it was just amazing. This is also the time period of Einstein. We all know about Einstein and, and, and his contribution to physics, but not only him, there were other scientists just as smart and then Einstein, but maybe didn't have the, the PR that Einstein had. One scientist called J.J. Thompson. Now, he has given credit to, to discovering what we call the electron. Now, before I proceed, the three subatomic partic the particles that we will be looking at are the proton, the neutron, and the electron, okay? That is what we at 130 um, will define as what makes up an atom, okay? So J.J. Thompson, in his work, is credited to discover what's called the electron. So I have a little video here to show you and how he did that, okay? Now, before I, sh before I do that, <clears throat> what, he, what he has here is uh, the beginnings, really, because this piece of equipment later on was utilized to make what we call the old-fashioned televisions. You know, we had this big old giant television that you were looking at, whatever you're looking at in the image. So if you look over here in the front, I don't know if you can see my mouse, hopefully, this is coated with a special material. Now what happens is in the back, uh, we create particles. And these particles are shot to the surface here, but we see this green color. And when that particle, which is full of energy, hits that surface, it transfers that energy, giving us this greenish fluorescence color on the screen, okay? So let me, let me start the video. Uh oh. Is this video captioned? Yeah. Yeah, are there captions for this video? Are we having trouble viewing this? I'm having it. Yeah, we can, I can't hear anything. Okay. And uh, are we having a challenge with that? Yeah, I couldn't hear anything. Okay. Let me stop that. And we're going to go about it a different way. Camera go. Dr. Fred, if you could turn it up and turn the captions on. Okay. Um, can, can everybody see the image? 
I can see it. I can't hear it. Yeah, I, I can hear see it. it but okay. I can't hear it either. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of talk you through it. I don't know. But I'm checking my internet connection. If you um, press I the gotta... CC at the bottom, that should give you the captions. Yeah. Okay. We can go to we can go to captions. Okay. Now I will stop it intermittently so I can uh, add some some of my information. Here, let me start. Let me start from the beginning. And so basically back here in the back where you see labeled cathode and nanode, it's creating particles and these particles are then jettisoned to the front where there contains a special material here, one, the green material. As that particle hits that surface, it transfers its energy and causes the atoms on the surface to uh, get excited and then they themselves illum illuminate a light. This is, the, like I said, the, the precursor of the old fashioned television. Now what they've done here is uh, J.J. Thompson put a electrical field. So he basically put two plates here. And notice what's happened is when he put those plates and ran a current through there, that beam bent, okay? So that inferred something. That he got that beam to bend a little bit. Okay. So with the particle bending toward the positive charge, that infers that those particles are negative charged because positive and negatives attract to each other. Same scenario here, whenever you have any electrical current are uh, running through a cable of electrons along coupled associated with it is a magnetic field. So I can put a magnet in there and that's what he's doing. He's putting a magnet and it's, ca and it's causing that beam to be deflected, okay? Okay, now obviously we're not going to get into the equation here, but the point to take away from this is his work allowed him to calculate this ratio, okay? Now, once he had that ratio further down the road, which this ratio, one of these is an unknown, specifically the mass of the electron. But once we knew one of the variables further down the road later on, we're able to calculate the mass of the electron, okay? so. Let's go back oh, to this. <laughs> so based on JJ's work, he, he determined that these particles, which we are called electrons, I mean, be wondering what are electrons? You have electrons all around you. You know, if you have a bad hair day, what happens? Your hair goes boom, right? Those are electrons. You walk on carpet, and you kind of show, drag your feet and you touch something, you get a little spark, those are electrons. Uh, the electrons that are powering our electronic devices right now, the, the power is coming from electrons. And so electrons are all around us, completely all around us. All right, so now based on that, JJ put a, a model later on in 1904, so we're breaking into the 1900s, and he proposed that the 
the model of the atom was that someplace in that atom there was some kind of positive uh, charged sphere, okay, with the electrons being just put all over the place. Not knowing yet, not even having enough data where to put them, he, he, he used what's called the plum pudding model with the electrons just being all over the place of the atom, okay. Well, notice we're talking 1904. Now we go a few years later, 1911, another English uh, scientist, Rutherford. Now what he is credited with is discovering the nucleus, okay? Now he did a, a, a procedure, uh, very similar, okay? Uh, but slightly different, you know? We'll, we'll, we'll try to see if we can uh, All right, here we go again. Okay. And so what is what he's doing here, he took a, a gold foil and he took these particles, which are called alpha particles. We're not going to talk a lot about those. And he did very similar like J.J. Uh, Thompson's work. He was able to create a, a stream of particles and run it through the gold foil. Surrounding that gold foil, he had the same material. And so the majority of the particles came across through the gold foil and hit the fluorescent material and they illuminated it. But what surprised him that not all of them did that, because based on JJ's model of the plum pudding, theoretically, all the electrons, all the particles should just go through, but some of them ricochet. Some of them ricochet straight back to the source. But you can see at different angles that uh, the particles are being ricocheted. And so these particles are shooting through, a lot of them go right through the gold, the gold material, the gold foil, but some of them hit something that's a lot bigger than them and it's causing them to ricochet. Just like shooting, you know, you're shooting pool and you want to angle to the right pocket or something. Instead of going straight through for a straight shot, you got to give it a little bit of an angle to get to that side pocket. Well, what was happening here is that was that exactly the alpha particle hit the nucleus but the nucleus is so big that it caused the alpha particle to ricochet someplace else to a different direction. Okay. And so to explain that scattering, based on Thompson's model, they expected all the, the particles to scatter to go through, but Rutherford's work showed we got scattering going on. So there must be something in the atom that is that is so massive that is causing the alpha particles, which are much smaller, to ricochet off. Okay. So in, in uh, 1917, based on his work, Rutherford is is credited to discovering the proton slash the nucleus. Okay. Later on down the road, we find out, you know, a few years later, about uh, a, few, well, a few years later, 1932, another gentleman, scientist by the name of Chadwick, he's credited with discovering the electrons. So the model of the atoms is coming around little by little. And so we have in the nucleus, in the center of the atom, we have the proton. And along that, with that, we have the um, neutron. But we still didn't know at this time how the electrons are occupying space. Okay. And so that, that comes in later here to explain what's going on. So what basically we concluded is that the atom itself is really a lot of empty space. 
if I were, for example, if I put, brought the hydrogen atoms to my scale, and I represented the nucleus of the hydrogen atom, my electron is orbiting roughly about three quarters of a mile away. There's a lot of space in between, a lot of space. Okay, so each atom has a small dense nucleus with the protons and, and, the, and the nucleus. Okay, now, give you some magnitude as to what size we're talking about. If the nucleus, I just gave you one example, but here's another example. If the nucleus was the size of, say, a small marble, then the atom itself would be the size of the cardinal stadium. It's got a lot of space in between. There's some numbers there to give you an idea as far as uh, uh, diameters. Uh, the atom here, diameter 10 to the negative 8 centimeter diameter, and nucleus is 10 to the negative 13 diameter. Very, very tiny. Okay. So, with respect to what are called subatomic particles, just the three of them, the electron, the proton, and the neutron, they ha each have their symbol. The E with the superscript hyphen or negative is a symbol for the electron, okay? And it exists outside the nucleus. And the proton has a, po a P, lowercase p, with the superscript positive because it has a positive charge. Okay, and it is part of the nucleus. And then the neutron has no charge. And it also exists in the nucleus, okay? And it has a relative charge of zero, no charge. Now, because of these masses being so tiny, what we use is relative mass. We assign the proton and the neutron a relative mass of one which means that the electron has a roughly a relative mass to zero is so small, okay? And so if the nucleus, let's say, weighed 200, 200 pounds, the electron will be about a tenth, tenth of a, but yeah, tenth of a pound of, uh, in weight. It's extremely tiny. The electrons are so tiny, it's just, it's mind boggling how small they are, but yet, they play such a big factor in how chemical pro properties occur. Because all the reactions, it's all about electrons. It's all about electrons forming. It's all about electrons breaking, how electrons interact with the neighboring atom, and the, which affects the properties, whether something's very viscous and certain things very, you know, watery, not so viscous. But we'll have, we'll have a lot more to say that about that. Now, with respect to atomic notation, in other words, we have 118 elements up here, okay? Now, we, when we want to represent them, we use the following format. SY represents, it's a symbol for whatever element we're looking at. Now, superscript left, that is what we call the mass number, okay? And superscript, subscript left, the Z, is what we call the atomic number. Now, if you look at the periodic table, we have um, the atomic number. Every element has an atomic number. Now, the atomic number represents the number of protons and the number of electrons. Let me pull up my um, periodic table real quick. Oh, where'd it go? Yeah, one second. And so we can, just by looking at the periodic table, there it comes, we can define, we can get a, gather a lot of information very quickly. So, if we look at carbon, or excuse me, if we look at carbon, atomic number number six, okay? Just by finding this position and knowing it's, it's uh, atomic number, here's carbon, okay? Carbon has six protons, six electrons, okay? Now, when we want to de determine the 
uh, number of neutrons, notice underneath the symbols, we have a number which we call the atomic weight, okay? Now, what you need to do is to take that atomic weight and round it up to the nearest whole number, okay? So for carbon, it has an atomic weight of 12.01. When we round it up to the nearest whole number, it has a, what we call a mass number of 12, okay? Mass number 12. Note the difference. The mass number is a whole number. The atomic weight is a decimal number. To figure out the number of neut neutrons for any of these elements shown here on the product table, you just take its atomic weight, round it up to the nearest whole number and take, that becomes the mass number. Subtract the mass number from six. So 12 minus six is six. So that is the number of neutrons, okay? We can do that for any element. Let's take number, uh, take boron. B has five protons, five electrons, okay? Its atomic weight is 10. 8.1, round it up to the nearest whole number, which is 11. 11 minus 5, 6. So boron has 5 protons, 5 electrons, and 6 neutrons. Carbon, what we just did, has 6 protons, 6 electrons, and 6 neutrons. Okay? Think an easy one here. Hydrogen, very first atom. Okay? It has, its atomic number is one. It has one proton, one electron. Let's calculate the number of neutrons. Well, we take its atomic weight, 1.01, round it up to this nearest whole number, which is one. One minus one is zero. So hydrogen has one proton, one electron, and zero neutrons, okay? So just by, Looking at finding the, the element on the product table, you can very quickly calculate number of protons, number of electrons, and the number of neutrons. Now, the thing about protons, protons define the element. You can lose neutrons or gain neutrons. The same is true for electrons. You can lose those all day long, lose or gain them and you won't change what that element is. But the moment you change a proton, either by adding a proton or losing the proton, you totally have a whole new element, okay? And so to give you some thought, here is where lead is, number 82, and the alchemists from back in the Harry Potter days were trying to make gold from lead, well, they go from a 79 to 82, how many protons they need to lose? Three, right? And where are the protons? They're inside the nucleus. And any time you try to do anything to the nucleus, any idea what may happen? Boom, hydrogen bomb, okay? Very difficult to do. Okay, anytime you do anything to do anything, anything to break up the nucleus, there's so much energy in there, uh, it could be quite hazardous. So it's quite difficult to make lead from gold. But if you have any ideas, um, we'll, we'll figure it out. Maybe we can do that. <laughs> All right, so let's go back to the, uh, the slide. Okay, so the atomic number, that's the number on top of the symbol for the periodic table we give you. Some periodic tables have that number below the symbol, but the one we give you is on top. That tells you how many protons you have, how many electrons. The mass number is the sum of the protons and the neutrons, okay? And to very quickly find out what the mass number is, you take the atomic weight, which is the decimal number in the periodic table, round it up to the nearest whole number, and now you have the mass number, which is the whole number. Subtract the number of protons, and guess what? You have the number of neutrons. I have a quick question about that. So say sure. like, so say if you look at silicon, like the, the mass, um, 
the mass number is 28.09. So yes. I would need to, so I would need to round that up to 29 or would I round that down to 28? No, you use the same rules. You're going to nearest whole number would be for what number would you got to get rid of the decimal. So before I do the decimal, you have to do 28, 28.09. Is that 28 or do I round it to 29? What number would that be? Well, I'm assuming you would round that down because it's... No, because just like our rounding rules. Remember the rounding rules? You yeah. look at the neighbor, you look at the neighbor. If it's less than five, you leave the eight alone. The neighbor for eight is zero. Okay. You see it right here? Okay, all right, all right. Okay, and so right. what, would you, what, what would you do for nitrogen? Number seven. You would, you would leave that as fourteen, right? You got it. Okay. What about potassium? Number nineteen. Then that one would go to thirty-one. Anybody? Thirty-one. Number nineteen. Um, yeah. Number. Uh, yeah. Right here. What would be the mass number for potassium? I would say at thirty-nine. Oh, at thirty-nine. You got it. That is correct. What about argon? Number 18. 40. You got it. And so by rounding the atomic weight to the nearest whole number, that gives you the mass number, okay, which is a whole number. And now you can subtract the atomic number, which is the number on top, and that gives you the number of neutrons. Okay. Yeah, that, that good questions there because you you got to make sure that you're rounding in the correct direction. Okay, remember we're either going to leave that number alone or bring it up, depending on the rounding rules. Uh, where are we at? Okay, so so right now as we stand, just by using the periodic table, you have a lot of information already. You have how many protons, how many electrons and how many neutrons, just by any element, uh, any of the 118 elements that we have, okay? Now, every, every element, like I explained, has the same number of protons, all right? And in the element, the number of protons equals the number of electrons. Now, let me ask you, let me ask you guys a question. We just show from the videos that the protons have a positive charge, correct? And the electrons, we determine that they have a negative charge. Now, if I have five positives and five negatives, what is my net charge? That'll be zero. Zero, exactly, good. That means that every element on that periodic table has an equal number of positives and an equal number of negatives. And so their net charge is zero. We're gonna to get to the point that be, where the, where, what, let me restate that. Depending on the position on the element, it's gonna determine whether they lose one electron or gain an electron. Now, like I said, you can lose neutrons and electrons all day long, gain or lose them but you don't lose protons unless you become another element. And so let's take uh, sodium. Let me, let me go up here for a second. This is a concept that I'm introducing it a little bit early, but it will, it will come clearer in a second. Well, in a few, this chapter and specifically in the next chapter. All right, so with that, what I just stated, that our net zero for all the elements, or our net charge for all the elements is zero. Let me give you a hypothetical here. Not really hypothetical, it's really a true thing. Sodium has how many protons? Who can answer that? 23? 23? Pardon? No. 23? 11. That's the mass number. Okay. Sodium is number 11. How many protons does it have? 11. Anybody? It's not 23? 11? No. 11. The atomic number on top 
the atomic number on top tells you how many protons it has. As correct, um, Amanda has 11. How many electrons does it have? Based on 11. what you just said. 11, okay? Now sodium, had, because it's a metal, tends to lose electrons, okay? So what you ingest when you put on your french fries, you're, you're ingesting sodium ion and it loses the electrons. So now it has 11 protons and 10 electrons. So if I have 11 positives and 10 negatives, what is my net? One. Plus one, exactly. So it has a plus one. Now on the other end, take a look at chlorine. How many protons does chlorine have? Who wants to take that one? 17. 17. How many electrons does it have? 17. Start so is it only letter S. Is it only losing one electron? Or I'm, no, no, I'm, not, no, really, no. I'm not really following. Okay. How many electrons, how many protons? Chlorine has 17 protons. We know that because it's atomic number 17. How many electrons does it also have? 17. 17, okay. Now, chlorine has a propensity to gain one electron. So now it has 17 positives and 18 negatives. What is my net? Zero. No, 17 positives. 18 negatives. What is my net? Negative one. Negative one. What do I have left over? If I have 17 positive numbers numbers and 18 negative, negative numbers, one. I got negative. negative one. Negative one. And so chlorine, when it becomes ion, has a charge of negative one. So sodium ion, which is a positive one, combines with chloride, chloride ion with a negative one. And hence, you make sodium chloride, which is what you put on your French fries. Okay, but more on that just to when we talk down down the road here. I think remember the atomic number that is that number on top of the symbol tells you number of protons, number of electrons. The atomic weight when you round it up to the nearest whole number and you subtract the atomic number tells you the number of neutrons, okay? All right, let's go back to the slide. All right, somebody has their, their microphone on. If you can mute yourself, they'll appreciate it. All right, so the number of protons defines the element, okay? That's important. The number of neutrons and number of electrons does not define the element, okay? Carbon always will have six protons. Whether it's carbon that is made up, maybe it's a carbon atom in your body that makes up some type of muscle fiber, it's a carbon atom, it has six protons. Or if it's carbon dioxide as a gas, that carbon has six uh, protons. It just happens to be in different forms. Okay. What if it's an isotope? Or if it's an isotope, we're going to talk about isotopes. But even if it was the carbon seven, carbon eight, it'd still be that isotope. Okay. All right. Carbon, we're going to talk, kind of introduce it a little bit early. But carbon always has six protons. And like I said, we can gain and lose neutrons all day long. If we gain, neutrons, then we create what are called isotopes. I'm sure you all heard about carbon-14 dating and other ways of dating. That's still carbon. It just happens to have extra, extra weight because it picked up a neutron. But we'll, we'll get to that. Okay, so carbon always has six protons and it will always have six, when it's neutral, always will have six electrons. And uh, it would always have six neutrons, okay? So, yeah. 
mass number is made up of protons plus the neutrons. Now this, this slide here talks about what I just told you. Okay, to figure out the neutrons, we've got to figure out the mass number and we get the mass number because all we got to do is round up the atomic weight that you're given on the product table to the nearest whole number, okay? And subtract the number of protons, which is the atomic number. The, uh, um, which, okay, take the atomic weight, near round it up to the nearest whole number and subtract the number of protons. Now, what we do is we, we will write it out and say, let's say potassium. Potassium is number 19. Okay. Now here it's written kind of kind of strange. It says potassium hyphen 40. Okay. Now the way we want we do what this means is we're talking about. I'll get to well, I won't jump it in right now. But how do we write it in the notation, atomic notation? We put K, we can find out the symbol for potassium, which is K. And then they give us the mass number, which is 40, because it's hyphen 40. And we place that in the upper left superscript. And then the atomic number, well, that comes from the periodic table. Okay. So we just go to the periodic table, look up the number, that's 19. Okay. So the atomic notation for atomic 40 is just like, like, like it's written there. Now, how many neutrons? For potassium 40 are there. We simply subtract 40 minus 19, which is 21. So potassium 40 has 21 neutrons. All right. Now here's another example. They want you to write the atomic notation for bromine 81. Step one, bromine. Find in our product table so we know its symbol. And the symbol for bromine is Br. Okay, 81, they're telling us what the mass number is, is hyphen 81. So from the periodic table, we go find the atomic number, which is 35. Okay, so we write the atomic notation for bromine 81 as follows. To find the number of neutrons, we simply subtract 81 from 35, or 35 from 81, which means that bromine 81 has 46 neutrons. Okay. I have a quick question about that because I'm looking at bromine on the table and it's, yeah. it's saying the point is 79.90. Yep. So, and we'll why get... being, so why isn't that being added to, to okay. 80 instead of 81? And that's what we're going to get to. Those are called isotopes. Okay. Now, if we go, let me, let me introduce something here real quick. You have uh, bromine. Hyphen uh, 80. Okay. Now, if you go to the periodic table and you look at the atomic weight, you'll see it to be 79.90. Okay. Now, if you round that up to the nearest whole number, that is bromine 80. Okay. Now, with that bit of information, that bromine 80, and over here you got bromine 81. What do you think the difference is between the two? Now, could it be the number of protons? Would that be any different? No, not at all, because it's still bromine. It just happens to be in a different form. So the number of protons will still be 35, okay? What about electrons? So let's say electrons, that would be different then. The electrons would be different? Uh, no. Um, the, uh, it would Wouldn't the electrons be 35 still? Yes, the electrons That's are still 35. So what is the difference between the two? The number of neutrons. Exactly, because Bromine 81 has 46 neutrons because we subtracted 81 from 35, right? How many neutrons do you think bromine 80 has? 45. It'd be 45, right? Exactly. Okay. 
what we just introduced here is isotopes. Now, every element up there has a number of isotopes. And what that is is simply this. It is that element. We got bromine 80, bromine 81. Both of them have 35 protons. Both of them have 35 electrons. The difference between the two is that bromine 81 has an extra neutron compared to bromine 80. Okay. Now, uh, every isotope, like I said, every isotope, every element has different isotopes. We're going to get some examples here in a second. The reason that bromine on the periodic table, when you look at the, and when you look at the uh, atomic weight, is 79.90. That number is the average of all the isotopes for bromine and the percent composition that they have in nature. For example, your, your grade for the course is in there a certain percentage for the homework, right? Certain percentage for the exams, certain percentage for the final. They all have a certain percentage. So you're bringing in a certain amount from every part of the assignments in your class. Now, be, because bromine 80 is the most abundant, that's why you the most abundant isotope in nature could be 90 some percent. The overall average atomic weight is closer to bromine 80 because it contributes more to the other isotopes. Okay. And that's why that number in the product table is closer to 80 because that is the average. So the point being is the atomic weights that we give you, we don't use for your significant figures. Why? Because they come from whole, whole numbers. Bromine, uh, which has atomic weight of 79.90, comes from bromine 80, bromine 81, and I believe 82 a little bit, okay? And so those are averages of whole numbers. And whenever you have averages of whole numbers, you have an infinite number of significant figures. So we don't use that. Okay. We'll, we'll have some more examples here about the isotopes, and hopefully this will be clear because we'll show you, we'll do a specific example like uh, carbon. So isotopes. Right now, th there is carbon 11, but not, some, not a lot. We got carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14. Every one of them is carbon. Every one of them has six protons. Every one of them has six electrons. The difference is carbon-12 has six neutrons. How many neutrons does carbon-13 have? What would carbon-13 have? How many neutrons would carbon-13 have? 13 minus 6. Seven. Seven. Okay, so it has carbon-13 will have seven neutrons. How about carbon-14? How many neutrons would it have? Eight. It. Exactly. Okay. Because all those isotopes are carbon. They just differ in that they have different number of neutrons. Now, when we go to the periodic table and we look at the atomic weight, you'll see the atomic weight is 12.01. That is because the majority of the isotope is in the form of carbon 12. And hence, when we average out the atomic weights, of 12, 13, and 14, we have to incorporate the percentage that they have in nature. So 13 and 14 don't, don't give that high of a percentage. Carbon 12 is a, probably in the 90s. Therefore, when we average those numbers out, the number for the atomic weight is 12.01, okay? Now, all of them have six protons, but they differ in the number of neutrons, six, seven, and eight, okay? So let's, let's take an example here. All right, oxygen 16, oxygen 17, and oxygen 18. 
Now, with the information I gave you, you could be asked the question, what is the most abundant isotope of oxygen? How would I figure that out? What could I do? For, for that matter, for any element, okay, let's take uh, um, magnesium. which is number 12 right there, okay? And if you're asked the question, which is based on the product table, can you tell me which magnesium is the most abundant isotope of magnesium? What, what do you mean I, by abundant? Abundant in what? In, in amount. Okay, earlier, earlier I said, let me back up here, Okay, remember I, I stated there's three isotopes here we're introducing, carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14, okay? All of them have a different amount of concentration in nature, okay? Now, carbon-12 is in the 90-some percent amount. You, when you analyze soil and you look for carbon, the bulk of it is in carbon-12 form. So that is the most abundant carbon isotope. Carbon-13 and 14 are less abundant, okay? And because they're less abundant, the percentage that they bring to the overall atomic weight is much less. Therefore, the average of 12, 13, and 14 is closer to 12, specifically 12.01. That is the atomic weight of carbon. And so if we go to back to the periodic table, you can be you could be asked you could be asked a question of any isotope, and let's go back to um, magnesium, which was 12. You don't have to memorize anything, you just find the element. Take the element, take the atomic weight of the element, round it up to the nearest whole number. What is the nearest whole number of 24.31? 24. 24. 24. So magnesium 24 is the most abundant isotope of magnesium. Okay. Take uh, uh, bromine, which we did earlier. What is the most abundant isotope of bromine? 80. Bromine 79. Oh, round it up to nearest whole number. Bromine 80. 80. Bromine 80. And then, uh, anyone, iron. What is the most abundant isotope of iron? Iron 56. 56. You got, you got it. Exactly. Okay. Because again, those atomic weights they are closer to the isotope that contributes the most amount in nature. And therefore, when we average out their atomic weights, which are whole numbers, their atomic weight is closer to the most abundant isotope that's there. Hydrogen, which would be the most abundant isotope of hydrogen? Hydrogen. One. Exactly, hydrogen one. There is hydrogen two and there is hydrogen three. Uh, deuterium, well, I won't give you the names, hydrogen two, hydrogen three. They're there, but their, their contribution is much smaller with respect to concentration than when we average out one, two, and three and, and incorporate the percentage that each one brings, the number averages out closer to one, 1.01, 1 .01. okay? So let me clear this. We go back to the isotopes. And so we go here, we have three isotopes, oxygen 16, oxygen 17, oxygen 18. With the periodic table, which would be the most, without answering the rest of the questions, which do you think would be the most abundant isotope of oxygen? Oxygen 16. 16. Oxygen 16, exactly. All you have to do is go to the periodic table, 
that number is already rounded up pretty close to the whole number, 16.00. Okay, now, what is it that they all have in common, 16, 17, and 18? Do they all have the same number of protons? Yeah. Yes. They'll have the same it, number it, of protons and electrons, right? Exactly. They have the same number of protons and the same number of electrons. Okay. Now the mass number is given to you there because this that number after the hyphen. So the mass number for oxygen 16 is simply 16. And for oxygen 17 is simply 17. Okay. And so the number of protons are the same for all of these isotopes and the number of electrons, okay? Remember, the number of protons is what makes this element oxygen. And the mass number comes directly from what you're given, and the number of neutrons is simply the difference between the mass number and the protons, and hence eight, nine, and 10, okay? Now, oxygen 17 and 16 are not very abundant in nature. They're there, but not very abundant. So again, when you average 16, 17, and 18, and then you incorporate the percentage each one brings in, well, there's gonna be a lot more 16 than there is 17 and 18. Okay. And it, hence the number uh, atomic weight for oxygen is 16.00. Okay. Um, This kind of table can be done for any of the elements. It could be done for carbon, carbon 12, carbon 13, carbon 14, all right? So you might be, uh, be aware that it could show up someplace. <laughs> all right, so th this is why the, the percentage is a little bit different. Why we have our atomic weights or decimal numbers, okay? We have carbon 11, carbon 12, carbon 13, carbon 14. All of them have six protons, all of them have six electrons. Where they differ is the number of neutrons, okay? And so carbon 12 has six neutrons, carbon 11 has five, where you 17, carbon 13 has seven neutrons and 14 has eight neutrons. Now, the relative percentage and natural amount that they have is out, out in nature is given there. So 98.89% uh, is in the form of carbon-12. There's about 1% in uh, carbon-13 and very small amounts for 11 and 14, very small amounts. And so when we average these numbers out, 11, 12, 13, and 14, and then we uh, also incorporate the percentage that they contribute, just like your grade is broken up in percentage, we end up with a atomic weight of 12.01. And that's why we can take the atomic weight on the periodic table and round it up to the nearest whole number. And that tells us the most abundant isotope in nature. So if you take 12.01, round it up to the nearest whole number, you get 12. So carbon 12 is the most abundant isotope that you find in, in nature, okay? All right. <clears throat> this one here is pretty self-explanatory. So let, let's, let's, looking at the periodic table, okay, you might be asked a question, okay, which is the most abundant? Is it lithium-6 or lithium-7? So what do we do? We first got to find where lithium is at. And lithium is element number three, okay? Next step, after we find in the product table, we look at the atomic weight, round it up to the nearest whole number, and 6.94, it rounds up to seven. Therefore, the most abundant isotope is lithium-7, okay? Now take a look at chlorine-35, chlorine-37, okay? Well, we first have to find the symbol. We gotta find in the product table. And chlorine is uh, numbered uh, 
17, element number 17, its atomic weight is 35.45, okay? Which means that the most abundant isotope would be which one? 35, chlorine 35. Exactly, chlorine 35. Now, do we have to memorize this? No, just based on the information I gave you, finding it in a product table, we can deduce the, the most abundant isotope of any of those elements, any of the isotopes up there. Okay. All right, now some, some of these are radioactive, and a lot of them are radioactive as far as the elements are concerned. Um, not very stable. A lot of them have been man-made. The last three, uh, 115, 16, and 17, I believe, they were made a few years ago. But um, they're, they um, have since been named. So your product table is a little bit dated, has been updated with the new name so that they've been given. All right, so chemical formulas. All right, so chemical formulas tell us what type and obviously the number of atoms present in the molecule. Um, they don't really tell us the bonding order, how things are bond, bonded together. I will tell you this, we will always tell you when we have a compound, which one is a central atom. Generally what happens is you have a central atom and then bonded around it are the other elements, okay? Are bonded around it in some type of bond. Now, the number of atoms we denote, as I mentioned before, with subscript, okay? If H2O, like I said, represents two hydrogen atoms and one, one oxygen atoms. Um, if it's a one, we leave it blank, we don't write in. It's understood as one, just like the mathematics, okay? Now, right now, you can see it's written H2O, doesn't tell us that bonding order. Hydrogen is not bonded to hydrogen the way it's written, H hyphen, H hyphen O. It's actually oxygen is the central atom and the hydrogens are bonded to the central atom. Now this one here says that there are three carbons, six hy uh, hydrogens and three oxygens. You're given a general formula. You're not given how it's put structurally. So all you can you all you can do, deduce from that formula is there is there is a total of twelve atoms, three carbons, six hydrogens, and three oxygens. Okay. Now <clears throat> sometimes we will get something like this where you see parentheses. And then you've got N for nitrogen, hydrogen, and subscript for, and then N parentheses. When you see parentheses in chemical formulas, that is what we call polyatomic ions. Where do I, you may want to get familiar with this one here. On the periodic table, if you look on the left-hand side, you'll see most common polyatomic ions. Those guys are put together in a packet. We don't separate them. They are together with a spe specific number of atoms. And when we need to represent more of them, more than one, we put a parentheses around. The one you see in the example, you see the first one, ammonium, NH4. Okay? That is the ammonium polyatomic ion. Poly means more than many atoms. Okay, now, um, bear with me for a second. Okay, all right. So what this tells us is that parentheses subscript two, we have two NH4 units. So total, we have two nitrogens, eight hydrogens, one carbon, and three oxygens for a total of 14 atoms in this particular compound. That, by the way, is called ammonium carbonate. All right, now, how many atoms do we have in each formula? We have H3PO4, okay? 
I know we don't know the name for this, but you keep, this is called phosphoric acid. If you drink soda pop, you drink a lot of H3PO4, okay? All right, so we have three hydrogens, one P, which is phosphorus, and four oxygens. So we have a total of eight atoms for the first one. The second one is Ca, which is calcium, and in parentheses, OH, there's another polyatomic ion that you'll find this one in the periodic table. And there's two of them, okay? And that means we have one calcium, two oxygens, and two hydrogens. That, by the way, is uh, calcium hydroxide. You'll find that in a lot of Tums. So next, next time you ingest Tums, that's what you're ingesting. <laughs> And then this other one here, we call that aluminum sulfate. Notice there's a subscript in front of aluminum, Al, meaning there's two aluminums. And then we got that bracket again, okay? So inside we have a SO4 unit called the sulfate. And there's three of them, three of the sulfates. So that means that we have two aluminums, three sulfurs, and 12 oxygens for a total of 17 atoms. 17 atoms. So be familiar with these, this type of compounds. And remember the brackets just tell us those are units. We don't separate them. If we need more than one, we can just add, we put a parentheses and then a subscript to tell us how many we need. Eventually we're going to get to the point where we're going to be able to write these formulas and even name them. Okay. All right. So the law of, of um, definite proportion or composition just simply says that when we put a compound together, they come together in a certain percentage. For example, H2O water. We know there are two hydrogens and one oxygen. If we break it down and calculate the percentage, it turns out that water has 11.2% hydrogen and 88.8% oxygen, be it water here in Arizona or be it water on the moon, okay? H2O, and that's the composition, okay? So <clears throat> that being said, congratulations. We're done with chapter four, okay? Um, any questions? Hopefully I didn't put you to sleep. <laughs> what what chapters are in the next exam? Is it? Uh, four, five, and I believe six. Uh, let me verify that. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Those of you who haven't done it yet, make sure you, you uh, 